Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see everybody here today for Transfiguration Sunday, which means we're getting ready to start Lent. And with that said, it would be great if anyone is available for a few moments after church to help us prepare the sanctuary for Lent. We would appreciate that. In your bulletin, we also have the Lenten schedule. So feel free to take a look at this. And all of these are going to be live. They'll also be recorded if you prefer to uh, watch them a little bit later. March 2nd is Ash Wednesday. That'll be at Mount Carmel. And all those are going to be at 7 o'clock p.m. Looking further in our bulletin, upcoming events. We do have our flea market on March 12th. And April 2nd, you definitely want to circle that one on our calendar. Get us ready for Easter. Let's do a good spring cleanup. If you're available to help out on that day, that would be great. And that's going to be from 8.30 in the morning until noon. April 2nd. Anything else that needs to be brought to our attention this morning? The young boy approached his slightly older sister with a question about God. He asked, can anybody ever really see God? Of course not, silly, came her response. God is so far up in heaven, no one can see God. Then the boy approached his mother with the same question. Mom, can anybody really see God? More gently, his mother answered, No, not really. God is a spirit that dwells in our hearts, but we can never really physically see God. Her answer was somewhat more satisfying, but he still wondered. And not long afterwards, the boy's grandfather took him fishing. They had a great day together, sitting out there on the lake. And as the day was winding down, watching the sunset, he asked his grandfather the same question. The grandfather was watching the sunset, just filled with the peace and contentment of the day. Can you tell me, can anybody ever see God? Grandfather sat there for a moment. Then he said simply, Grandson, it's getting so that I can't see anything else. Today, we get a glimpse of God as we talk about the transfiguration. Let us prepare our minds and our hearts for worship.
Let us come together, all who seek and would serve the Lord. Let us open our hearts in prayer that God might direct our paths. And let others see in our paths the power and the glory of God. And let our paths bear witness to the mercy and love of our Lord. Then let us open our hearts in prayer and sing praises to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us join our hymn of gathering. I sing the praise of love almighty. Number 50. Come to you, the plea in our 
hearts as any more of them, and not for you to show us yours. So often our hearts have been closed to your leading, and we have missed so many opportunities to be blessings to others and to be blessed by God. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to have the courage to open our hearts to you. In Christ we pray. Having received new life through the generosity and love of God and the hope that Christ brings, one fact remains that does not change. God has loved you, loves you now, and will always love you. This is the good news that brings us new life. The Almighty and merciful God grant us pardon and remission of our sins, time for amendment of life and the grace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture is Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. <clears throat> While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our hymn, Jesus Take Us to the Mountain, number 183.
O oh Lord, direct our thinking, speaking, and our hearing, that we may more fully know you, and let your word be our lamp in all darkness and doubt. Amen. I have talked about some of my mountain climbing experiences with my brother Jim and different sermons. And a mountaintop experience, we're going to have to do another one today. And you know, as I read this, I think back to a conversation I had with Jim, where he's talking about going climbing and doing some other stuff, and I said to him, you know, I'm a hiker, not a climber. And Jim looked at me and said, well, for a guy who's not a climber, you have some pretty impressive mountains on your list. To think about that, and yeah, I, I certainly have, thanks to him. But let's go through another interesting story of this, and maybe perhaps it tells more of Jim than anything else. But it was nightfall in the Rockies, skies dazzling with starlight set against the dark silhouettes of mountain peaks. It's been a good week that I had spent with my brother. One of my first time spending some time out there with him. And I had done some stargazing that week. Jim got me to climb some mountains. But it was time to return home. And the next morning, I was to be at the airport to catch my flight. So we're outside his house, right outside Long's Peak. And I was surprised at Jim's response when I mentioned and pointed in the distance you know, I didn't get a chance to climb Estes Peak, which was kind of on my list. It kind of sticks out there. It looks kind of unusual and neat. And it's the 100th highest peak in the park. And I said, next time. Let's uh, make that a priority for next time. And Jim replied, it's only midnight. He said, if we rush it, he said, I'll bet we could be back by 3 a.m. Well, as I'm telling you what a horrible idea this is, a bunch of us started running down chasing Jim in the dark along this trail to summit Estes Peak in the middle of the night, and I have no clue how to get there at this point, about that time. Been up there a number of times since. But four of us are running through the woods in the dark using shortcuts that really only Jim knew. And I think that we spend most of our lives in the lowlands, which are relatively safe, flat, routine, as predictable as we can possibly make them. There's comfort, there's safety, there is security on that couch in your living room while you're watching TV. But every once in a while, we're inclined to take a risk to scale a mountain, so to speak, to view life from a new and different interesting perspective. And this was certainly one of those times. I'm jogging through the dark, smiling and thinking how crazy all of this is. Being an astronomer, running a planetarium, I'm quite comfortable in the dark, that's not a problem. The moon was somewhat up, so there was some light. It wasn't a full moon. And we navigated by that slim moonlight, used the flashlights very sparingly, and within an hour, we started hiking a very steep rock face to get up to the summit. Now in today's scripture, we find Peter, James, and John at the foot of a mountain. Might have been Mount Hermon, it might have been Mount Tabor, not really certain. But when referring to a mountain in the Bible, there's an association often related to the closeness of God an association to the readiness to hear God's words. It's recorded in the Old Testament that God appeared and spoke to Moses and later to Elijah on mountains. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find Jesus inviting his three closest followers to come with him up to the mountain to pray. What an honor to be singled out for that experience. And as prepared as these disciples were after spending that time with Jesus, they had no idea 
what really awaited them. The climb itself is a journey of self-discovery. You learn something about yourself as you push your physical, your mental, and your emotional limits. You're trying with each step to strip away the ordinary, get back to the very simple basics, a search for your true self that's been buried in layers of responsibilities and the shrapnel of everyday living. A mountaintop experience certainly could create a very life-changing moment. We've had them. We've all had them. It may have been that first time you decide to ride that first two-wheel bicycle and they took the training wheels off, right? After the trusted training wheels are removed, you shakily mount onto this thing. Probably not alone. Somebody you trust was at your side holding the bike steady for you to get on. Might have had their hand in the back seat as you start to pedal, trying to keep you straight and balanced. Confidence is increasing, knowing that there was someone there to catch your balance or to catch you if you fell. And as the bike gained momentum, that person let go, and you were on your own. Your destination was in sight, your house is a block away, anticipation builds as you continue for the first time to go solo. If you look back, you realize that your achievement didn't come in one day or even two. Your journey had its ups and downs. There might have been humiliating moments like falling off the bike in front of your friends or leaping from the toppling bike into the grass, but you kept at it. You kept hearing your partner's words alongside of you, I'm right here, we'll keep trying, it's going to happen. Confidence builds up yours. Ready, set, go. He called and you're off again. And this time when you let go, you're ready and set and bicycling down the sidewalk on your own. That's it. You're doing it. Just keep your eyes on the goal. Shout from behind. <coughs> and your helper surprised you by running ahead. You saw him there, grin on his face. You did it, what a rush. Victory over fear, victory over failures, victory. Isn't that what it's like with our relationship with Jesus? He's the one we can trust to be at our side. The one whose hand holds yours, the one who takes away your fear. He's the one who sets you free to solo. He's the one who is watching over you always. And he promises, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so it was with Peter, James, and John as they had a life-changing experience on that mountain. Jesus by their side. A summit moment that seems unreal and have a lasting impact on their lives. Because when you reach that summit, when you get to that moment of victory, you have a newfound appreciation for the world around you and also for the people who helped to make it possible. You have a newfound faith and strength and the honesty of vision and purpose that only, only God can give. Our gospel lesson tells us that while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, his clothing became dazzling white, and Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. What a glorious moment! A moment the disciples did not want to end. Peter, of course, blurts out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And as he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them. Then from out of the cloud, a voice said, This is my son. The Chosen One. Listen to Him. When the voice had spoken, 
Jesus was found alone. Peter, James, and John heard God clearly state that Jesus was his son and that they were there to listen to him and not to their own ideas or their own desires. And the same applies to us. As we follow Jesus on our guide, as our guide, on life's path. As Isaiah the prophet reminds us, whether you turn to the right or you turn to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. We listen and step out with confidence, even when the path is dark and uncertain. For Jesus is the way. Listen to him. When the glory of that mountaintop experience disappeared, when the cloud went away, and the conversation with heaven was over, Jesus was alone with his disciples. Jesus, their teacher and friend, was really the Son of God. Talk about a confidence booster. The summit's an amazing experience. You want to bask in the wonder of all of it to see this new perspective, to take it all in, to let it really sink in, to celebrate that moment and that achievement. I asked Jim once what he did when he got to the summit of Aconcagua, the highest mountain in South America, at nearly 23,000 feet. He told me, you give thanks you take some pictures, you leave a piece of Grammy's fruitcake, and you get out of there. It's not a place where you can linger. The same was true in Estes Peak. We arrived shortly after 1.30 in the morning. I laid down in an area surrounded by rocks to keep the cold wind away from me. I just looked out at the stars a sprawling majesty of the Milky Way. And you looked up, you could see the lights of Denver and some clouds in the distance, and literally, after three minutes, I heard Jim's voice announcing, all right, let's move, it's time to go. I like the quotation by Henry Drummond, a Scottish theologian, when he said, God does not make the mountains in order to be inhabited. God does not make the mountaintops for us to live on the mountaintops. It is not God's desire that we live on the mountaintops. We only ascend to the heights to catch a broader vision of the earthly surroundings below. But we don't live there. We don't tarry there. The streams begin in the uplands, but these streams descend quickly to gladden the valleys below. The streams start in the mountaintops, but they come down to gladden the valleys below. And it is those valleys, those are the places where our day-to-day -day living really occurs. On top of that mountain, three disciples experience God's presence. And when they came down, their spiritual vision had drastically changed, improved, and helped them to arrive at their destination. In the fall of the year, Linda, a young woman, was traveling alone up a rutted and rugged highway from Alberta to the Yukon. Linda didn't know you don't travel to White Horse alone in a rundown Honda Civic. So she set off for only four-wheel drives normally venture. And the first evening she found a room in the mountains near a summit and asked for a 5 a.m. wake-up call so she could get an early start to make it through the pass. She couldn't understand why the clerk looked surprised at the request, but as she awoke to early morning fog surrounding the mountaintops, she kind of understood. Not wanting to look foolish, she got up and went to breakfast. There weren't many people there at that hour, but there were two truckers, and they invited Linda to join them. The place was so small, she felt obliged. Where are you heading? 
one of the truckers asked. White horse? In that little Honda Civic? No way. I said, listen, this pass is dangerous in weather like this. Well, I am determined to try it, was Linda's gutsy reply. Well, truckers looked at each other and they said, I guess we're just going to have to hug you. Well, she kind of backed away from that for a moment, and then they started laughing. They said, not like that. They said, we're going to put one truck in front of you, and we're going to put another truck behind you. And you're just going to stay right between us as we go over that pass. We'll get you through the mountains. And all that foggy morning, Linda followed the red lights in front of her and had the reassurance of a big escort behind as they made their way safely through the mountains. How many times are we caught in the fog of our dangerous passage through life? At those times, we really need to be hugged. The fellow Christians who know the way and who can lead safely ahead of us and others behind, gently encouraging us along so that we too can pass safely. We need each other. We need Christ to help guide us through those special moments of life so we might gain clarity and we might get some insight into the divine. When Peter, James, and John came down from that mountain, Jesus told them not to tell others what they had seen. It's going to be hard for others to understand what they had experienced of God's kingdom and of its mysteries. It really was an aha moment. It was a personal moment. So isn't it time for each of us each of us to embark on our own personal journey with Jesus as our guide? The question really becomes, <clears throat> are you ready? Are you spiritually fit and equipped for that journey? Are you open, are you willing to listen and obey the voice of God? As we prepare for Lent, begin first with your mountaintop experience with God. Let us commit ourselves this day to seek in all that we do to be close to him and to follow his path. Amen. Are there joys and concerns that you would like to share with us today? Concerns for the uh, people of Ukraine. We will mention those in the prayer, absolutely, as our world gets tossed around a bit. Yes. Any others? Let us pray. Gracious God, who fills our world with transforming brilliance, that all who choose might escape the shadows and go into the light. We give hearty thanks for a faith that lifts us, that can get us hope-filled and spirit-born. In a world of hands that push us down and point when we fall, the church family is called to extend hands and offer able assistance and have reach out in the activity of prayer. For this call to counter the world's unkindness with a bold, Christly compassion. We offer our gratitude and we offer our praise. We pray too for an expansion of appreciation. Teach us to see the gifts that are ours by grace as clear signs of your loving generosity. Help us to know in our hearts that we have been richly blessed and that you call us to creative sharing by the way of faithfulness. Grant a special awareness of our brothers and sisters around the world. We thank you that in every situation, every dark moment, you are active and working among us. 
even when things seem at their bleakest, we trust in your sovereignty and in your strength. We ask your special blessing for the people of Ukraine. As we watch war unfold, we ask for your grace and your peace to rule in the hearts and the minds of all involved. May our relations with them truly embody the love of Christ through an outpouring of deeds and mercy. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
reflect and repent, pray and proclaim. Establish your footing on the love of God and let your faith be upstanding and firm. Amen.